Good morning everyone. Welcome to this act of worship uh, for Trinity Sunday, the week after Pentecost. So we will be thinking a little bit about what it means for God to have been revealed to us in that Trinitarian form through the, the three persons of the Trinity. We will of course be praying for our world, both of course in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic which is ongoing and also in terms of the events which are happening across the Atlantic in the United States. Also because this is the first week of a new month, the month of June, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper, so communion. So if you want to join in communion at the appropriate time, you'll need to make sure you've got your own piece of bread and uh, something to drink so that you're able to eat and drink uh, and join, therefore join in the sacrament. So as always we begin by coming before God in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God we give thanks for the many different ways you make yourself known to us. We praise God the creator who made our universe and everything in it. We praise Jesus the son our redeemer. And we praise the Spirit, which is our helper and guide, which unites and empowers us. We praise one God in three persons, the Trinitarian God. And we give thanks even if sometimes we find this hard to understand. Lord, you are at the heart of creation. Your word is brings life into being. Your peace gives our living its fulfilment. Your spirit unites us into your Son. We draw near, seeking your love in our hearts, your wisdom in our minds, and your power in our lives. Receive us with grace in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Lord. And we bring our prayers together in the words of the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
Our reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 28. We start reading at verse 16. This is the very end of Matthew's gospel. This is how he chooses to end his story of Jesus. And there's a huge amount happening just in these few verses. So we start reading Matthew 28 verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's Trinity Sunday. Time to think about the eternal mystery of the Trinity. Maybe not the easiest of weeks to uh, lead worship. The problem is that we think about the Trinity in all sorts of ways, but none of them are ever quite sufficient. So there's all sorts of analogies and examples and ideas people have used to try and get across the idea of the Trinity. Maybe the Trinity is a bit like an egg. An egg has three parts. It has the shell, it has the white, it has the yolk. They all work together to make an egg. You can't have an egg without any one of those things. It doesn't really work as an analogy because whenever you use an egg to do anything, the first thing you do is open it up and throw away the shell because you don't want that part. You only want what's inside it. Some people talk about water or states of matter, if you like. So we're used to the idea that water, which is the same substance, we see it as ice, we see it as as liquid water, we see it as as steam or or water vapour, as a a gas. And so the same substance can appear in those different states. And that's fine as far as it goes, but it implies that God in three persons in the Trinity is really just one God in sort of slightly different forms or appearance, which is also not quite right. Um, it also ignores the fact that there is plasma, which is a fourth state of matter, but that's a... We won't get into that now. The clover, the clover is a good example of this um, idea associated with St. Patrick, particularly the clover has three leaves, you need all the leaves to make a clover, but that then implies God just divided into three different parts. None of these things, were, all of these things give us some idea of the Trinity, but none of them really properly explain it because it seems a cop-out sometimes but the Trinity is a mystery. God is a mystery. We know some things about God but God remains ultimately mysterious. There are things we cannot know or understand about God and I've even heard it suggested that the whole doctrine of the Trinity is to stop us thinking that we can ever fully understand God because it is something that is so difficult, so tricky for us to grasp. So there's the nature of the Trinity, dealt with in two minutes. Um, Obviously we could talk a lot more about that, but I think it's more interesting uh, and relevant to us in some ways to think more about this passage. And the Trinitarian formula that we have here in Matthew 28 is quite possibly added in after the initial writing of the Gospel, maybe added in the years later. Because it took people a long time to work out that doctrine of the Trinity. All three persons of the Trinity are there in Scripture. And so the idea of the Trinity is there in Scripture. But it's not explicit. 
it's not worked out to its sort of fullest potential. That only came later, it took a long time. Uh, and many ecumenical councils and lots of theologians having long discussions to begin to work that out. And how exactly we understand the Trinity has been a, a point of division uh, in the Christian Church for the last 2,000 years and, and, and continues to be so today. But let's think about Matthew. Let's think about Matthew's Gospel and how he chooses to end the story. Because I think beginnings are important but endings are important as well. How a book ends matters. Where does it leave you? And Matthew gives us an amazing amount in just these few verses. So we've got the 11 disciples. Remember Judas by this point has betrayed Jesus. So he's no longer around. So we've got the 11 disciples and they've travelled back up to Galilee. So that is back to the northern part of Israel from Jerusalem in the south. They've gone to where they've been told to go and there they encounter Jesus for a final time. The risen Jesus. And Jesus tells them that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. And he gives them some tasks to do. Tells them what to do next. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now this is a verse that we can under has been understood in, in different ways. But there's a universality there, isn't there? All nations. Or we could translate that as all all peoples. It does not say, go out and tell people who are like you about me. Keep it within our own little world. Keep it within our own cultural or religious tradition. We don't want anybody else getting in on this. Go out to everybody, making no distinction between different peoples. I don't think it means go out and by force make whole nations into Christian nations against their will, which is how it has been understood and has been used to justify all sorts of uh, acts which we now would very much like to disassociate ourselves uh, from in the church. So go and make disciples. And that phrase there, make disciples, the actual word in the Greek is the, ver the verb is to disciple. It's the same word as the noun disciple. So go and disciple people. A disciple is a person who learns, somebody who learns from a teacher. And so the point is to make Jesus their teacher, to teach people, to tell people what Jesus, who Jesus was, what he said, what he did, so that they can themselves become disciples. And we should baptise them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Well, we, we do that in church today. That's one of the things we certainly do. Um, and then we should teach them also to obey everything I have commanded you. So there's an act of teaching, a baptism, of discipling. Do we do that in the church today? Do we fulfil, if these are instructions given to the, those original disciples, and we are of course their successors, do we do that in the church today? And Some of these things we do and some of them perhaps we don't do so well. How do we? Go and make disciples of people. How do we teach people about Jesus? We're good at doing that once they've come into our church buildings, I hope. We're maybe not so good at going out into the world. But we also have to remember that how we act as Christians, how we are seen to act, is important. Because we need to not just tell people about Jesus, we need to live our lives in a way that shows that we follow his commandments, his teachings, which is not an easy thing to do. And that's something as we do think about, do we resume services uh, physically in the church building, when and how exactly we do that. The world is going to be watching us, people are going to see us, and we need to make sure that we do that in a way which shows God's love, that we believe God, the love that God has for everybody, but also shows how we Think about our own communities. But that's not the end of the passage. We don't end with Jesus giving these stern instructions saying, go, do this. We end with a promise. We end with a reminder of Jesus' love. Remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
that's Matthew's final, final sentence. It's easy to miss it. It's very, very important. The, the, the story ends with Jesus promising that he is still with us. And that's something that we can always hold on to. I think that should be absolutely central to how we think of ourselves in the church. The only reason that we can do all these things, which we may have been, we have been told to do, is because Jesus is there with us to help us, to care for us, to guide us. And because, of course, the Holy Spirit is also with us to help us, to guide us. So there's a promise there that we will not be alone, that Jesus is with us. And we're shortly going to be celebrating communion. And going back to the idea of the Trinity, this is a time when we can see the Trinity at work. The three persons of the Trinity each have a part to play in what we do in the Lord's Supper. We praise God as creator. We look back into the salvation history of the people of Israel. We remember Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross and the resurrection and the Last Supper. And we remember too the Holy Spirit, who's there to make the ordinary sacred, who allows us to do the things that Jesus has told us to do, who helps and guides and supports us. So this passage is a challenge, but also a promise. Amen. So we come to our prayers of intercession and we're going to start with a prayer which has been uh, published this week by the United Reformed Church in response to the events in America. So we'll use that prayer first and then we'll go on to some more general prayers. So let us pray. Eternal God, deeply troubled by what is happening following George Floyd's death and by too much other inhumanity that doesn't reach the headlines. We cry to you as the one whose love was the victor at Easter and who pours it into our hearts at Pentecost. As we observe the pain of a fractured world, use your love to drive us from sadness to compassion as we watch the pain of the bereaved, use your love to move us from pity to companionship as we are faced with the pain of marginalised people. Use your love to point us from complacency to your commonwealth. In our praying, let us not just talk to you but yield to your love. In our anger, let us not just rail against injustice, but manifest your love in our actions. Let us not just flail about aimlessly, but build the civilization of love. Until none of us are disregarded for who we are, nor any diminished by what we fail to be, we keep on praying in the name of Jesus Christ. Loving God, we pray for the sick, for the unwell. We pray for people at home and in hospital who are struggling. We pray for those who are close to us and for those that we do not know. We pray for people in hospital and we pray for all of those involved in caring for them in different ways. We pray too for our friends in nursing homes and for those who are shielding and unable to go out. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray too for those who are in mourning, for those trying to rebuild their lives after the death of loved ones. We see the horrifying statistics each day and remember that each of those numbers represents a person with a family, with friends. Someone who was loved and cared for. So we pray for all those who feel a great sadness at this time. And 
we pray that they will receive the love and support that they require. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember too the church, our own local congregations, our other local churches, and everyone across the world who in different ways is trying to be a disciple of Jesus. Everyone who is trying to put that great commission into action. We pray that the church will always remember that promise that you will be with us always to the end of the age. And we pray that we can, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, work out how you are calling us to act in our world today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen.
We come to our time of communion, our celebration of the Lord's Supper. Anyone watching this who wants to eat and drink together with us in memory of Jesus is very welcome to do so. Jesus shared many meals with many people, with those who came to hear him preach, sometimes with strangers, sometimes with his closest friends. And we know that he ate a final supper with his 12 disciples and maybe many others. And so we say a prayer of thanksgiving. If you want to join in the responses at home, then please feel free to, to do so. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks and praise to the Lord. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right that we should always offer thanks and praise to you, our Lord and Redeemer. You have created and sustained us and have showered us with many blessings. Let the heavens rejoice and the earth be glad as we join together with all the faithful saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise you, O God, that in your mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We give thanks for his, his humble birth, for his life and ministry of love for his suffering and death on the cross, for his glorious resurrection, for the promise that he will come again and that he will be with us always. Lord, we ask that you send your spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Pray that they may become for us a symbol of the body and blood of Jesus Christ that we might in him be united in faith, inspired by love and encouraged with hope. And we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. All honour and glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And so we hear once again the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper as recorded by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so with the, our bread and our wine, we do as the Lord commands. They become for us the Holy Supper to which he calls us. Take, eat, the body of Christ broken for you. And after Jesus shared bread with his disciples, they shared wine. 
and we, each in our own homes, do likewise. It is the cup of salvation, the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. God is spirit. God is light. God is love. Everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. Let us bless his holy name for ever and ever. Lord, you have fed us with the bread of life. You have drawn us closer to you and closer to each other. We pray this will strengthen us for the road ahead, allowing us to live the life in all its fullness that you came to bring us. Amen. So that brings us to the end of our worship today. If you'd like to join us for our virtual coffee time and you are watching this on Sunday morning, we're meeting on Zoom at midday um, in order to be able to see and talk to each other as much as we can in these times. So we finish as always by asking for God's blessing. May you glimpse the glory of God as you journey through this week. May you experience the mystery of God as you live out your faith this week. And may you know the blessings of God as you fulfil your responsibilities this week. And may you believe at all times that you are loved by God and that God is with you. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen.